wanted to make sure I said out loud, uh, I was reading the writer Arthur Brooks recently, who was saying that reading aloud is a bonding experience. So much of our reading now in this present day is, is like silent and private, and that's actually not how it's been for most of human history. And so thank you for allowing us to read out loud to you and uh, hear your reading as well. Next poem I have is called uh, Watching a Computer Animation of the Los Angeles Fire 3 Helicopter Crash. Uh, my father was a paramedic and died in the line of duty. For my father, 1964 to 1998. You are in the red and white chopper on the other side of the screen, the other side of the sky, and I cannot see your face. The mountains you fly over come into the foreground, non-threatening, royal. The machine glides like it's entering the sky for the first time through a portal from another era. The main rotor spins, unspooling the air around it. It is a video game the way the tail rotor snaps off, the way the chopper tilts left and wobbles. You and the others are now cedar wax wings drifting over the expansive green of Griffith Park. In the army, you jumped out of planes. On my ninth birthday, you and I did a skydive simulator. How did Norma, the wounded girl airlifted, look? Is there no way to tell me how you are doing? The wounded chopper approaches land, the brown and green landscape blurrier, block-like. Then pine trees appear like popsicles out of the ground. The pixelated helicopter clips the tree, crashes, lodged in the ground like a stake. There's no fire in the animation and no sound. The trees tower, still and huddled, around the chopper, as if they might bend down at any moment to you in the debris. And I want to just say about that poem, uh, I should have said it earlier, but um, I was very influenced, obviously, by this sudden event in my life. Um, and because it was a very high profile event and um, there was litigation, uh, one day years later, I was, I just searched for this and I found a video on YouTube of like a recreated simulation that was played in, in a, like in the courtroom. And so I wrote a poem in response to, to watching that. Uh, and that's what that one was about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Primo. Um, I have a, I'm going to take a little detour and read a poem, not from the book, but um, that was recently published in um, Alta Journal, um, which is a journal that I really recommend to people. It's a beautiful, beautiful journal. Um, this poem, um, it's called Qualifying Animacy and um, I'm not sure I'm not sure how much international um uh attention that this particular story got it was more of a local story um but I'm sure folks in Los Angeles or Ventura County might um be aware of this um uh back in 2020 when it seemed like well it's still happening I mean every other day you hear of somebody being um an innocent person, particularly a person of color, being um, brutalized by um, police violence. And um, this was um, the, the murder of Andres um, Guardado, who was a, a like a teen, um, a young man who was who was killed by um, by L.A. Sheriff um, deputies um, for for no reason. Uh, and um, I wrote this poem after um, after reading the reporting on his death. Qualifying animacy. They killed another young man yesterday, this time at his job. When asked for comment, the police said, no uniform, no one saw it. When asked for comment, his Theo promised, I never saw him sad or angry. 
When I saw the news, my first rage and spit. He was a teen. He was a student. And look at how I qualified his breath with a resume. I thought of you and what mothers must collect as proof of the light that once warmed the body outside of their own. Birth times, brown eyes, el mundo detrás de pestañas largas, Dodgers hats, faded blue, hair slicked in tres flores and mother's spit, second grade, pictures tucked along the edges of the bedroom mirror that you used to fall asleep on the sofa, a near grown man dreaming in soft miho peace and someone still awake in the house draped you in a tigre cobija as you drifted that it crowned dandelion when you laughed. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, I have a few more to share uh, from Levitations, and this one is called Rowing. I'll read it in English and Spanish. When the fire department came to the door to deliver the news, my mom locked herself in the bathroom, pulled out the 409 cleaner and a rag from the bathroom cabinet and started scrubbing the sink. She moved her arm back and forth like a rower. The paramedics, his colleagues, knocked on the front door and say, saying, Lisa, we've got to talk to you. She kept scrubbing, making circles with the rag on the cabinet, the counter, the mirror. Remando. Cuando los bomberos llegaron a la puerta para entregar la noticia, mi mamá se encerró en el baño, sacó el limpiador 409 y un trapo del gabinete del baño y comenzó a fregar el lavabo. Ella movió su brazo de un lado a otro, como un remador. Los paramédicos, sus colegas, tocaron en la puerta delantera y dijeron, Lisa, tenemos que hablar contigo. Ella siguió fregando haciendo círculos con el trapo en el gabinete, la encimera, el espejo. Thank you. I just, I can never get over with that poem how incredibly Nick is able to capture like the that moment of no return when you hear something that's going to just devastate the rest of your life. Um, I just like have so much awe for his ability as a poet to enter that and stay there in the in the cleaning. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, this poem is called. Um, so in the year after my abuelito passed away very suddenly and and um I don't know if I mentioned before but due to like systemic um uh like racism essentially in the hospital where he was treated at um and uh so there was like a um he was older yes but there was like a a uh, violence about the way that he went out um and there was a lot of um just like walking around in shock and walking around with my abuelita and trying to like go on little grief adventures I guess I would call them it's just just like we're here another day just what do we do with this day and just keep moving forward um um trying anyway and uh we went to a lot of gardens um it seemed to be a, a place where we found um, peace. Um, we're most like ghosts. We're most like ghosts in botanical gardens. In the city side, we don't live on empty weekday mornings. Admiring the work of the rose breeder, 
crossed at the pollen, cut at the hip. Bushes named after someone's old auntie. Mini Pearl, Blanche, Heather, Never Maria, Consuelo, Lupe. Benches bronzed with the names of trustees, provosts, philanthropists, the rich dead, considered by thousands of daily visitors. Who sees the camellias we planted back at the house next to the alleyway, the one that took you, sees your life? Beautiful. Uh, and thank you, Crystal, for, for your words. I love uh, grief adventures. Uh, I think all of us who have sustained loss would characterize the days in the aftermath that way and, and the days long after that sometimes. Uh, this next one's called How Rain Appears. I will also read the Spanish. Um, I think being very transparent with you all and, and being a little self-conscious. I was like, well, I've spent a lot of time thinking, writing, working through this, this event. And, um, but in, in doing so, I also know that when we lose loved ones, there are other relationships that that person has. So this is my dad, but he's not just that, he's that to other folks. And so in this poem, I'm thinking about his mother, uh, my grandmother. How rain appears. Losing a son in the prime of his life is like losing a mind, not in a dark time, not a period of great duress, not gradually, just all at once, the way the sky goes from not rain to rain, to rain, to rain, to rain, to rain, the way the mind thinks everything's all right this morning, or that God is here. And then no, of course, God doesn't exist, never did, and those who think so have never been, never mind, this is what it's like to lose a mind. I mean what it's like to lose a son. And what are we without our minds, without our sons, without our sons, my God? And, and thank you so much. Um, in Spanish, como aparece la lluvia? Perder un hijo en la flor de su vida es como perder la cabeza. No en una época oscura, no en un periodo de gran coacción, no gradualmente. Solo de una vez, la forma en que el cielo pasa de no llover, a llover, a llover, a llover, a llover, a llover. La forma en que la mente piensa que todo está bien esta mañana, o que Dios está aquí. Y luego saber, por supuesto, Dios no existe, nunca existió. Y esos quienes piensan así nunca han sido, no importa, esto es lo que es como perder la cabeza. Quiero decir, es como perder un hijo, y que somos sin nuestras mentes, sin nuestros hijos, sin nuestros hijos, Dios mío. Thank you. Um, Nick and I have spent a lot of time talking about this um and like seeing how it how it moves through in our in our poems this idea of yeah watching somebody else who's lost who you've lost but it's like a different relationship and then as a poet sort of inhabiting their voice um and trying to understand what that might be like uh this poem uh I wrote a few poems throughout the uh, book that are um, written from the perspective of my abuelita. Uh, and uh, a lot of them, I, I always say, I, I can't really take much credit for them because some, like a lot of the lines are just straight out of her mouth. Um, my abuelita is 91, um, gracias a Dios, and she, um, is she she received an eighth grade education um, and would never tell you um, she's like I'm not a 
I'm no soy poeta. I'm not a poet. Like I'm, I'm not very, you know, intellectual or whatever or artistic, but she's like the greatest poet I know. And some of the things that she says, I just sit there and I just catch them. And that's like, all I can take credit for is just like writing them or, or recording them. Um, so, uh, this poem, um, Ha Pasado Un Año, um, it translates to, I code switch a lot in this, um, it has been a year. Ha Pasado Un Año, de Clarita Busto Salas. Quiero recordar todos los recuerdos y paseos que tuve con mi esposo. I want to sit and write them all by hand. En mi vida... Mi esposo me decía, Clarita, Clarita, ¿quieres esto? Clarita, vamos, vamos para allá. Cla Clarita, siempre con mucho cariño. How he would talk to me. And this I remember well. No quiero, no quiero vivir en un panteón. Sometimes I pull books off his shelves. I thought I had read every Bonietowska, but found something new last week. Y mira, a veces lo leo y lo abrazo a mi pecho. Please, don't buy me orchidias with the flowers florecidas anymore. I know they are enchanting. Caras abiertas, ready to be looked at, but the stems with the closed buds, viven mas. Beautiful. Uh, I have two more for you all. And um, this next one is called Self-Portrait as Nick Martinez. Uh, all right. Self-Portrait as Nick Martinez. As another person, as an other, same me or different me, smart kid or not a smart kid or smarter kid, beans and rice, more beans and rice, and the same walk down the street in Wilmington to Foster's Freeze for dipped cones. So not so different me, some quiet magic stalks of light undone at morning. And I would be grapefruit. I would be star fruit. I am a kind of stone fruit. No, I am a kind of stone. Entonces, it would still be me. Same nod me, same brown stone. My mom's name in this country is the one sacrificed. Laid down. Así que todo sería el mismo. Same trees and streetlights y las mismas voces. Or this. Nothing would have been the same. Nick Martinez, alter ego, <laughs> alter alternate universe. Um, this will be my last poem. Um, this is another thing I'm very curious. I know this was a problem in the United States um, where nobody could find toilet paper at the start of the pandemic. I don't know if that was a uniquely American thing. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, <laughs> what was that that happened here oh it did okay all right well I feel a little better because it was pretty embarrassing <laughs> um so this last poem I wrote thinking my abuelito passed away before the pandemic um but I found myself like in fits like bursts of um anxiety about him when everything was going down because I, I guess my mind wasn't quite used to him being gone yet and so I'd be like oh my gosh what are we gonna do because he was really like he was really headstrong <laughs> and I just can imagine him um I was just trying to imagine like how he would react and all of that or how he'd behave would he stay inside you know when he was supposed to or would he get stir crazy all of that so I was just trying to think about um but I found myself getting like worried or being like what would he think about all this and also really missing that he wasn't here to like protect us I guess um so uh yeah we all agree to hear your laugh in the air at the news of the toilet paper shortage 
on Channel 4, our city, where there is suddenly no Charmin, no Kirkland, no Purel, si, Vapuru, no crystal geyser in gallons, only Arrowhead, the last water on earth that tastes like dirt. Ay caray, you would say, as you try to leave the house, to see your friends at the grocery checkouts, the Trader Jones, the Vons, the food for less for California garlic. Ito, no, los viejitos tienen que quedarse en la casa. I worry about you being out there in the public air. You were so alive when you died, viejito. Today, Michelangelo is at the Getty, and no one can see him, even with all their extra time, or your favorite Rembrandt at LACMA, torn down under construction, since you left anyway. Yes, I am home from school, reading and watching too many pendejadas on Netflix, but staying inside, only leaving to deliver groceries to Ita and Elizabeth, all of us with immune systems, que sufriendo since you left, more vulnerable than ever, but we keep each other, and some of us keep God. You might have patriarched in overdrive, buying our groceries, or maybe you would have disappeared hours in the cave of your records, compliant in meditation with sus canciones. It's hard to say where we would be now, hard to know where any of us would be without this enfermedad in el aire. Today, the air quality in Los Angeles is the cleanest in the world, even over your barrio, where the city forgets your neighbors, who are now called essential, still going to work so everyone else can stay at home. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. And I, I love also this idea of universes and the multiverse and that we were hearing your Ito's laugh uh, in the air. I'm going to end with Kingdom. Um, this is about uh, my another grandmother uh, who, yeah, I love. Kingdom. To hold a tostada is to hold a kingdom. And she holds Wednesdays for us. Family night, primero the beans on the flat shell like a raft, and then the chicken shredded care, lettuce, cheese, salsita. Y entonces vamos a platicar around the dining room table laughing at her jokes and chismes. Grandma, hay más salsa? Yes, mijo, over there, by the beans, the stove, the kingdom's boundless space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for a lovely reading. Um, you weave it together really nicely, I think, so that's great. Um, the other thing I think that's fantastic about um, about these Zooms is that we get to uh, compare the contrasting styles of, of like the way people write in North America and the way people write here. And they are, you know, they're different. It's difficult to, um, it's difficult to highlight what the differences are, but you'll hear um that people do write differently it's quite interesting the way that works so thank you so much for sharing your work um it was lovely to see you nick it was lovely to meet you for the first time it's lovely to see you both and it was great to see you again so thank you so much and i think what we'll do because we only got 45 minutes and we've got quite a few people wanting to read so people in the room if you want to go out and refresh whatever drink or food you have, then please do that. But I think we're going to go and start the open mic straight away. Um, anyway, so, but but if you don't mind people moving in and out of the room here, um, I think we should do that. I'll just go and get my list so I know who to call. Uh, so we know... 
You're all familiar now with the rules, the way it works here in the open mic. Um, I'll call you in a random order. It may be that I'm calling you online or you in the room. Uh, one reading, please. Um, no epics. If you have to know, if you have to ask what is an epic, then don't read it. <laughs> um, and I mean it. So there we are. So we'll start, uh, I think, since... Uh, Nick and Crystal have been uh, reading online. We'll start in the room. So let's start, please, uh, and come and stand here in front of the camera and the mic so everybody can hear you. Uh, we'll call, I think we'll start with Jez. It's you. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. See you all. Hello. Um, this is actually an epic, but I'm not going to give you all. <laughs> <laughs> this, we're sorry. No, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna serialize this. It's gonna be parts of this one. Um, just to give you a backstory, it's something I wrote about five years ago. I spent about a year and a half, two years writing it. It was kind of like trying to squeeze everything into one kind of body of work. So yeah. So I'm gonna read you the first stance. So the, the title is called Epoch. Start from black, and there was light, peppering of materials and heats. All matter of the universe expanding from the size of a human head. Add in time and say, good morning to the sky, good morning to the plow, good morning to the man that never slept. Start me from nothing, clear me from nothing, and add nothing to nothing, which equals minus nothing, which is definitely something. Expanding and spreading, and everything will appear as if it was always there, like a house protecting you all from the bed. Woken from a nightmare of repetitions, again a morning of again reflection, to all of you asleep, again awaken. Do not be at ease in your slumber. Start everything all at once. Dance me this expanding infinity. So fast my eyes would never see a prayer. Only your results can be seen. Full sails of morning light. Start and finish with no middle. For I see both start and finish. If light were coloured black, I would not see morning. <laughs> Thank you, Jez. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back online now and I'm going to invite uh, Tina, please. Unmute yourself and uh, read. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, gotcha. Ken, can I just mention an event that I'm part of very quickly, please? No, we're going to mute you now. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, so I've got, um, my novel is out quite soon. It's called Dalfie Rose, and um, I'm doing a talk as part of Portsmouth Book Fest. It's on Monday the 27th of February at 12 o'clock, and it's at the Carnegie Library in Fratton, which is just five minutes walk um, from the station. I'm going to be talking about the, you know, the process of writing a novel, publishing it, and um and read a few extracts from the novel. So if you want to come along, it's a free event, but you need to book tickets um via the Bookfest website. So just to tell you about that, and um, my poem tonight is called Penhow Road, which is um the road that I grew up in until I was about ten, and it's in Fratton. And the Carnegie Library where I'm doing the talk is um quite sweetly the library that I used to visit as a little girl. Um, so it's got good memories for me. So Penhow Road, when I was a girl, we played in that street, skipped along pavements, hopscotched chalky squares, trickled shiny coloured marbles along broken slabs. When I was a girl, we zigzagged around the occasional car to greet small friends, laughing, skipping past front doors wide open. When I was a girl, rainbow streamers fluttered like washing in the breeze, faint sounds of radio, TV and chat wafted into the warmth of a summer's day. I walk past the house where I was born. The street feels smaller now, pavement silent, empty, fenced by wall-to-wall -wall cars, front doors firmly closed. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, okay. 
and we'll stay online, I think, and we'll invite um, Elaine, please. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good, good. Um, this is a poem that I wrote about um, living in Denver, where I went to graduate school. And when I arrived there, uh, there was a bitter fight going on uh, about desegregating the public schools. So my poem alludes to that indirectly. Mile, mile high on your way. Love, all day I peer out the window at the glass canyons of the city, an abyss stretching toward the mountains. Or maybe it's my own life reflected in the anonymity of people and traffic. I hate this city, landlocked, insular, and suffocating, with its people who glare at me. Are you Spanish? Not even the memory of your smile illuminates an escape plan. Lights flicker across the city, spilling their gold. Light has such a brief existence, old as it is, dimming into a petal's fall. Days, months, years pass as I languish in this place. When I'm with you, your words and smile are one. Your arms go around me and I am warm. But when I am alone, my life, like Colfax Avenue, uncoils from its byways and stretches into a snake 30 miles long without glottis or tongue. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, we'll come back in the room now um, and invite David, please. I'll take a look. Okay, let's go up higher if you need it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been reading a, a little bit of Dylan Thomas recently, and um, I've, I've always loved the guy. I run a, a very small um, play reading group and um, have a huge battle every year with all the other members, because I want to do Under Milkwood every year. And they think maybe once in five or 10 years is enough. Um, funny that. Um, but yeah, one particular poem, I, I, uh, I thought, well, this is so good. I, I, I just want to share it. It's not, um, it won't be unknown to you. It's perhaps his most famous poem. Burn Hill. Um, then I thought you can actually get it on YouTube by Richard Burton. <laughs> <laughs> Certain gentleman called Hopkin <laughs> and the magical Dylan himself. <laughs> so what the hell are you doing uh, reading it? But I also thought, well, maybe these people don't remember it. Maybe reminding them about it would be a good thing. Um, I've, um, yeah, okay, but, well, let's go have a look. Burn Hill. It's about, um, it refers back to his rural childhood, partly rural, I think, in Wales, and also to a, a, a dilapidated farmhouse, which um, was close to the house that he stayed in. Now, as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, about the lilting house, and happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry, time let me hail. And, um, sorry, I'm steaming up, it's too warm in here. <laughs> time let me hail and climb golden in the heydays of his eyes, and honoured among wagons, I was prince of the apple towns, and once below a time, I'd lordly have the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall light. And as I was green and carefree, famous among the barns about the happy yard and singing as the farm was home in the sun that is young once only, time let me play 
and be golden in the mercy of his means. And green and golden I was, huntsman and herdsman. The calves sang to my horn. The foxes on the hills barked clear and, clear and cold. And the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams. All the sun long it was running, it was lovely. The hayfields high as the house, the tunes from the chimneys. It was air and playing, lovely and watery and fire, green as grass. And nightly, under the simple stars, as I rode to sleep, the owls were bearing the farm away. All the moon long I heard, blessed among stables, the night jars flying with the ricks, and the horses flashing into the dark. And then to awake, and the farm, like a wanderer white with the dew, come back, the cock on his shoulder. It was all shining, it was Adam and Maiden. The sky gathered again, and the sun grew round that very day. So it must have been after the birth of the simple light, in the first spinning place, the spellbound horses walking warm out of the whinnying green stable, on to the fields of praise. Mm. And honoured among foxes and pheasants by the gay house under the new-made clouds, and happy as the heart was long, in the sun borne over and over, I ran my heedless ways. My wishes raced through the house high hay, and nothing I cared at my sky-blue trades that time allows in all his tune, tuneful turning, so few and such morning songs, before the children green and golden follow him out of grace. Nothing I cared in the lamb-white days that time would take me up to the swallow-thronged loft by the shadow of my hand, in the moon that is always rising. Nor that riding to sleep, I should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying. Though I sang in my chains like the sea, Thank you, David. Now, it is, um, you may not know, uh, this year is 100 years of BBC Wales. All right. And they were, they were saying that if they had not asked, if they had not commissioned Dylan Thomas um, to write for them, uh, we would not have Under Milkwood. So that's uh, really interesting thought, isn't it? Wow. Uh, Chris, please. Thank you very much and good evening. Good evening. Uh, just to explain, I provide creative art workshops. That's my starter. And I wrote this on Monday, sitting up in bed at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <clears throat> I was running a workshop in a market center. A tutor group of older teens, not engaging. Three or four seated on a market cart. And one lad I could sense at a point of discretion. I did the best I could, but unusually for me, I didn't quite get there. I just couldn't motivate. So I ended it there. Anyway, it was time for tea. <laughs> I walked to the tutor room where I'd left um, various things. To my horror, there were my two guitars without their strings. One, an antique Spanish. The other, quite new. Not, not damaged. The surfaces were quite new. But their 12 strings. Gone. It was 2.30 when well, I woke from this dream. I sat up. I woke up wondering, what did it mean? 
by being creative with and for others. Stories, rhymes, music, drama, imaginative times. But the meaning of my dream, its message I tried to see. Then I got it. I heard it. I saw it. I needed to be creative, sometimes just for me. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. I think we'll go back online now. Um, and I think it's time for Anne. Can you unmute yourself, please? Join us. I think I am unmuted, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I picked up my husband after his scan. He was radioactive. <laughs> Advised to stay six feet apart. Too late for that. Hummed all the way home. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, um, okay, never work with uh, children, animals, and technology. Apparently, my laptop is uh, on which the whole Zoom is depending is running out. So I'm going to do a quick flip next door and see if. Uh, if there's a, a charging cable that I can use next door. In the meantime, we will soldier on. Um, and we'll ask, stay, we'll stay online, and we'll ask Bob uh, to read, please. So if it all suddenly goes dark, it's my fault. Oh, no, I'm not dark. OK. Um, this is something I just wrote recently, um, like four bites uh, on the theme of a perfectly unformed thought. The poet's garden, thoughts not fully formed become the bounty each of us harvest from life's garden to share at the table made ready for friends and visitors. Poet's kitchen. Like a fine salad, all the ingredients are present. Combining is the challenge, the dressing, the tossing, that each person completes the dish. Each poem arrives fresh from my, my mind's kitchen. A perfectly unformed thought, ripe for creation in the bowl. Through the reader's critical eye, forked this way and that, teased into a unique mix, becomes tasty bites each soul anticipates. Poet's plate, each reader's palate tastes the words into existence after they are plated, like it or not. And finally, poet's dessert. Delighted after learning some have honored the prepared words with a read and a thought. That's wow. it. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, thank you very much. So while Ken is um, sipping for a uh, table, um, I think we'll probably stay on Zoom and we'll ask Britta to speak next. Just while we've got the, while we've got the battery power. Um, so Britta, um, you're next. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say a big massive thank you to Crystal and Nicholas for tonight's phenomenal reading. That was just incredible. Right, I would like to read a short poem from my current project. I'm currently working my way through Love in the Times of Cholera and turning the whole book into one big blackout poem. I don't know if you can see it, so I've got about 150 done. I've got 25 or so more to go. So this is today's blackout poem, and I'm just going to read it out to you. In the Shadow of Memory Memory slept in cemeteries roses and moonlight, always fearful, forever counting. Memory remembered love and time in the groves of orchids, in failure, in trips 
postponed for a reason. Memory remembered the only one with the others, radiated tenderness. Tenderness continued in the shadows. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Britta. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, so um, now, um, I think we'll probably stay on Zoom, actually, uh, while we still have some juice. Um, and Gudrun, are you going to read for us, Gudrun? Crystal and Nicholas, I, it was a great reading. I heard you in Santa Barbara, and it was really nice to see you once more here. Uh, I live up on the mountain, and with the recent rains, we had a lot of uh, mudslides, and that was sort of the origin of this poem. Mountain Drive. Scraped into the mountainside, the road loops around snow <clears throat> slopes, drops into gullies. Gentle at times, her banks softened by penicillium and wild cyanothus, like puffs of blue smoke. After the rain, scoured cliff rising uphill, boulders shadow the drive, half clinging, loom to tumble onto my path. Wary, I keep an eye on them, envy my dog bouncing ahead, nosing the ground happily. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Gudrun. Uh, so no cable outside, um, so we're in the lap of the gods. Um, Jolene, please. Hello, everyone. 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 Valentine's. Mm. Woken just after 5am. Ah, must be my stepson. Heavy teenage footsteps play a hallway rerun. Bleary eyed, I try to go back to sleep. No chance, I reckon, as I start counting sheep. Life of my fiance is never boring. I slow my breath, focus on his snoring. I give him a shove, it must be love. Something keeps me coming back. Is it all the sleep that I'm now lack? So, this is family living, annoyances and a lot of forgiving. It shows I love being with you, together appreciating everything that we do. Five years this spring, proving I've chosen you to be my king. I love my button deliveries, blowing away my laments and my miseries. Valentine's was around the corner. Winter's melting, let's not warn her. I'm writing this as a way to say... Be my Valentine again this year. Let's create future memories that will totally make you happily tear. You'll smile in that sentimental way that you always do. Because you know that my love is true. So, Mr. Soppy, <laughs> this romantic poem, yes, there is a hard copy to give to you as a romantic token. Let's hope tomorrow morning we don't end up getting woken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. So look, I'm just gonna take the call from here and say, look, it, just in case it, it all goes dark, we can carry on obviously in the room. Um, but I just wanna say again, a, a huge thank you to Crystal and Nick. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful to see all of you people uh, online. I know there are a couple of you who still, I think want to read. Um, so we'll, we'll get you in now while we still can. Uh, Luca, are you still there? Do you want to read tonight? Uh, Luca, I don't she think is there, but she said she didn't want to retire. Right, okay. Sarah? No? No. Okay, so we're only... We're done. ...in the room. We're in the <clears throat> okay, we're back in the room. <laughs> Sue? Hello, everybody here, everybody over the pond, or wherever you may be. Um, this is one I wrote today, it's called Suddenly. 
and it's self-explanatory, I think. Last yes. month, I fell off a two-step step ladder. Mm -hmm. Oh, a bit like that. Yeah. <laughs> Crash in the room. <laughs> Last month, I fell off a two-step step ladder, cleaning out kitchen cupboards. I was two steps up, took one step back. It's a recipe for disaster. Time stood still and I tumbled into space as I launched into nothingness. Arced up, over, down, down through thin air, pausing me in the slow motion that magnifies the everlasting second where everything changes, where a life is clearly seen, pin sharp, fragile, and infinitely precious. As I staggered in the midair of cold, of a cold breeze, topsy turvy, pieces of my life flung themselves in all directions, as did my crystal never to be used, never to be used again, diamonds cut decanter. Oh. So we all crash landed, lifetimes later, on the hard, calm light oak. Nine oak floor. Mm -hmm. As surprised as I, I think, at the intimacy of this violent and unexpected close encounter, my body bounced, catapulted, then crunched the soft side of me hard into the metallic edge of the open dishwasher door, mm -hmm. unyielding. Oh. What had just happened? I lay stunned, numbed. I noticed all the crumbs, the cobwebbed corners, the dollop of blood red orange marmalade, slightly smeared, the shattered, scattered crystal shapes, my pride, my joy, in pieces like me, waiting, just waiting, until it all began to hurt, and it did. But then life hurts sometimes. It knocks the everything out of you, shakes you to the core, and suddenly, after that split second of suddenly, all you can do is take time, retreat, and heal. So, no more cupboards for me. I've got myself a clean. <laughs> Nice one, thank you, Sue. Uh, Mike, thank you, um, Crystal and Nicholas, for an incredible uh, reading. I really enjoyed your work. It was so nice to hear, uh, particularly to hear it in Spanish, too. Um, so um, this is a poem. Well, just before that as well, I just wanted to very quickly say um, something that always strikes me about our, our evenings here um, is the power of words, right? You know, we know that they're not everything, um, but I think what makes us very uniquely human is that we're made of words. We're made of these stories, images, um, and that we're constantly reflecting and in a way reinventing um, who and what we are. And that's exciting to me. Um, <clears throat> this is a poem called Saturday Men. Saturday men wash cars and mow lawns, play football and cut down trees, build ponds and arse about in sheds, put up shelves and put down dust sheets, paint walls and water gardens. Saturday men go running in the park, tinker with parts from engines long dead, meet up with mates down the boozer, and don't really ever talk about how they feel. <laughs> Saturday men loom large around the town, getting stuff done and getting down to business. They don't stand still for long. The moment you spot one, in the blink of an eye, or before any kind of Freudian analysis has begun, they're off, like a dart, to the hardware store to find that part to replace the one that broke. 
Saturday men are just doing their thing in a Saturday man kind of way. And I watch as they pass like buses or trains, as they bustle and whistle away back to the suburbs behind lawns neatly kept in a house stood sturdy and strong. And Saturday men don't really know what it's like to not belong. But it's not their fault for being men who were built for a Saturday. And it's not my fault for wanting one of them to come and take me away to a house in the smart part of town, behind lawns neatly kept and pathways swept like clockwork every Saturday. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, and now Cosmo, please. <laughs> Think gravity or something like the ghost. Local gravitational field, I think. It's unusual for me because it's uh, beautiful, or meant to be. <laughs> um, and it is, after all, I'm going to continue with the um, Valentine's theme. It's a lot going. And it's meant to be playful and joyful. Meant to be. I love you to bitsicles, great chunky physicals, every pore and follicle, every cell and molecule. I love you to the ends of the earth. I love you through the longitudes, the latitudes and altitudes. I love you through the mistitudes, the tropics and the interludes, the dolphin glides and lunar tides. I love you to the ends of the earth. I love you to the ends of time, the purest notes, the Eden chimes. I love you to the gates of paradise. I love you through the airways, lightways, spaceways, and solar rays, the atmospheres, the passing years. I love you to the ends of the earth. I even love those shopping malls, the robes mm. and clothes that so enthrall, mm. the windows, doors, and objects dark that quicken your pulse and lighten your heart. I love you to the ends of the earth. I should say that my wife and I never go shopping together. <laughs> I love you in the sanctitudes, the silence.